Channel 10, KSAZ, The Spirit of Arizona. Bob Bruce, June Thompson with Dave Monty and Jude LaCava. This is Channel 10 News at 10. His day in court, both sides argue the fate of O.J. Simpson as detectives inspect the pavement for new clues in the case. And bullets fly, a federal agent murdered. Tonight, two suspects are under arrest. Good evening, I'm Rick D'Amico. Bob Bruce is off tonight. And I'm June Thompson. We'll have complete coverage of the O.J. Simpson hearing in just a moment. But our top story on this Thursday night, a federal agent cut down in the line of duty. It started as an undercover sting and ended with shots fired. Take a look at this map. This is where federal drug agents made their move onto suspected drug dealers, 51st Avenue and Bethany Home. It's also where one of the suspects shot that DEA agent. Agents catch one suspect here, and now another moments later near Northern and Grand. Tonight, Julie Steele Rodriguez has the latest. Hey, there is one injured officer, DEA 51st Avenue in Bethany. The officer shot, it's code four. They do a special agent for the Drug Enforcement Administration is rushed to St. Joseph's Hospital in Phoenix, but it is too late. He dies of gunshot wounds. It happened here near a strip mall at 51st Avenue and Bethany Home Road. DEA agents say the undercover officer was making a bust and something went wrong. He was acting in an undercover capacity and negotiating for a large quantity of drugs uh, was shot. It was just rapid. Boom, 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 boom. Like five of them, boom. And it sounded like two more or three more muffled. Officers arrested one man at the scene. They apparently took the other man into custody at Grand Avenue in Northern. He was wounded, and they rushed him to St. Joseph's Hospital as well. His wounds were not life-threatening. Details are sketchy as to how he was wounded. I believe it was by a law enforcement officer, but I do not have the facts. The DEA won't identify the officer who died or the two suspects under arrest, and they haven't said yet whether they're looking for anyone else. The investigation is continuing. I am now at DEA headquarters. Officials here still haven't identified the officer who died. They say he was in his 30s and had worked for this agency for about a decade, June. Mm. All right, Julie, thank you. And tonight, Mesa police look for a stalker, a man who already attacked one woman. Now, here's a composite sketch of the suspect they're looking for. Police say he went through unlocked Arcadia doors at an apartment complex and tried to sexually assault a woman. She managed, however, to get away. Uh, since then, he has uh, been harassing her. He left a note on her door on Saturday the 18th um, with some explicit terms in it. And since then, he's also been rattling her door, knocking on her windows, those types of things, and actually following her around. Well, obviously, we had the wrong picture earlier. Here is uh, a look at that composite sketch of the suspect. Anyone recognizing him should call Mesa police. And now it's O.J. Simpson's case, but the entire nation watched. Day one of a preliminary hearing to decide whether enough evidence exists to try Simpson for one of the most talked about double murders in recent history. Tonight, John Hook takes us through an eventful day and begins with a rare look at the defendant. O.J. Simpson in handcuffs, wearing his blue jail jumpsuit as he's transported to court. By the time court convenes, he's dressed in a business suit and for the first time wearing a tie, since he's no longer considered suicidal. As for the evidence, employees of a knife shop testify that five weeks before the murders, O.J. Simpson bought a 15-inch stiletto. That's the first item I sold him. The owner reveals he sold his story to the National Enquirer. The figure, I believe, is $12,500. An assistant director for the Los Angeles Crime Lab discusses more than 100 pieces of evidence gathered at the murder scene, at O.J. Simpson's home, and from his car evidence to be used in DNA comparisons, including a leather glove found in Simpson's home. Stains on it that we have not tested yet, but they appear to be blood. A knit cap found near the bodies containing hair consistent with an African-American, also containing strands of blonde hair, perhaps from Nicole Simpson. And exhibit indications of chemical treatment, i.e. bleaching. The judge rules the prosecution will be allowed to remove up to 100 hairs from O.J. Simpson's head to be used for comparisons with those found in the cap. Simpson sat quietly, at times staring off into space. Simpson's lawyer, Robert Shapiro, tries to discredit the witness, questioning her qualifications. Do you consider yourself an expert in DNA? Uh, not in DNA. Nicole Brown Simpson's sister and mother watch from the front row, as do the family of the other victim, Ronald Goldman. 
As the drama played out in court, detectives returned to the area of the murder, searching a vacant lot. They won't say if they found anything, but they continue to look for the murder weapon. Back in court, lots of legal maneuvering. Simpson's lawyers file a motion to throw out evidence they claim was illegally gathered at Simpson's home, including a bloody glove, blood found on the door handle of his car, and blood found in the driveway and inside Simpson's home. That motion led to several sharp exchanges between the prosecutor, Marcia Clark, and Simpson's attorney. I am representing a man who is charged with two counts of first-degree murder, where the people may be asking for the death penalty. Simpson's lawyers claim the police illegally entered Simpson's estate hours after the murders and gathered evidence. Now, police argue they went to the residence, Simpson's residence, found a trail of blood, and simply followed it, hot pursuit. As for the knife Simpson allegedly bought, next week a coroner is expected to testify that the same type of knife caused the wounds found on the two victims. Okay, John, thank you. Okay. A lot of ground covered in one day. So much happened in that Los Angeles courtroom. Tonight, some perspective on what it all means. Steve Kraft joins us live tonight from Los Angeles. Steve? Well, Rick, usually preliminary hearings are routine affairs, but this one is living up to its advanced billing as a mini trial, giving us a preview of evidence that will clear or convict O.J. Simpson if and when this case is brought to trial. That knife, over a foot long, seen in close-ups on TV screens worldwide. The most sensational piece of evidence to emerge in the preliminary hearing. Ross Cutlery on Broadway in downtown Los Angeles, just a couple blocks from the county courthouse, became a national name today. But whether the testimony of its salesman will be of much value should this case come to trial remains to be seen. Simpson attorney Robert Shapiro is already trying to yeah, label it a collector's knife, difference. not a killer's blade. And it doesn't help prosecutors that salesman sold his story to the National Enquirer. In any event, the murder weapon hasn't been found. Unless and until it is, larger issues loom. Which is why both sides squabbled over who gets to test blood and hair samples. Prosecutors won that right, but the defense will be allowed to peer over their shoulders. In the likely event this case comes to trial, DNA tests will be the battleground. All the defense needs is to convince one juror that test results are unreliable. Some lawyers say, with its unpredictable, media-savvy populace, Los Angeles is the toughest place in the country to convict somebody in court. That's O.J. Simpson's best hope. The parade of witnesses continues tomorrow in court, starting at 9 o'clock in the morning. Then, of course, we have the three-day holiday weekend, and the court will stand in recess. And finally, Rick and June, next Tuesday, the judge will consider the defense motion to throw out some of the prosecution's evidence, and that will be a very interesting hearing. Well, Steve, you're an attorney as well as a reporter. How do you see this first day in court? How do you well, there long, it? it seems to me that there were long periods today where there was just lots of maneuvering, and then suddenly the, there were periods were interspersed in of, of intense drama. And in a strange sense, it sort of unfolded like some sort of, of odd game. But then, of course, you have to remember that, you know, two people were murdered, another man's life hangs in the balance. So this is a deadly serious game, which is, I think, what gives this case some of its grim fascination. Yeah, it was gripping at times today. It was. All right, Steve, thank you. And another day of complete coverage of Simpson's preliminary hearing tomorrow. It starts at 9 a.m. right here on Channel 10. And lightning strikes again. At least 26 fires have burned over 48,000 acres in Arizona. And tonight, more sparks and new flames in the southern part of our state. Money from the federal government today helped to fight one of those fires, a 3,600-acre blaze near Oracle. Firefighters say they expect to have this wildfire contained by Friday. The wildfire northwest of Kingman is contained. Latest damage estimate, 36,000 acres. Tomorrow, eight Air Force fighting planes, firefighting planes, make their way to battle blazes here in Arizona. Stay up for tonight's Inside Story. We'll see how Arizona firefighters are stretched to the limit this time of year. That's later tonight. Tonight, Lake Havasu City tells 4th of July visitors nearly all the lake is open and safe and ready for them. But two city beaches do remain closed to swimmers because of high levels of bacteria. The bacteria comes from sewage, possibly from a sewage spill on the California side of the lake. Half to two-thirds of the lake is fine. Mm -hmm. It's just the area, the swimming areas, uh, south of the island at this time. Testing of six other beaches on private land or in Lake Havasu State Park showed bacteria levels in the safe range. Tonight, the first official report by a special counsel on water, or whitewater. 
Among other things, it shows the Clinton administration broke no laws by discussing the Arkansas land deal. It also gives some resolution to the controversy over the death of a former White House attorney. We're gratified by the independent counsel's conclusion that the so-called Whitewater events were not involved in the depression that led to Mr. Foster's suicide. He, of course, was referring to Vincent Foster. Tonight, critics say the report deals only with legal issues, ignoring ethical ones. Tonight, our first official look at the campaign finances of gubernatorial candidates in the state of Arizona. First, the Democrat, the leader in the money raised, Eddie Basha, with $725,264. Terry Goddard has raised $433,221. Another Democrat, former Phoenix Mayor Paul Johnson. Tonight, his campaign finance report shows he has $556,417. On the Republican side, Barbara Barrett's campaign raised $423,044. And finally, Governor Fife Symington campaign finance reports indicate he has $1,397,641. Earlier today, members of the governor's staff showed up at the state capitol and dropped off more than 13,000 signatures to the Secretary of State's office to earn a spot on the November ballot. 8,500 signatures gathered by candidate Paul Johnson, he turned in his petitions as well. Incidentally, Republican candidate Barbara Barrett turned in her petitions yesterday. Stay up for more on the Channel 10 News at 10. She earned it, but she doesn't have it anymore. Find out why Tanya's title gets taken away. That's before sports. Also ahead, it's hot out there, so why don't these people go inside for their exercise? Later, see if burning calories in the heat is healthy. Training tonight for hundreds of firefighters in Washington State. These firefighting students had their hands full with some man-made flames. Once they finish training, they'll head to California and help battle fires there. Whether it's California or Arizona, fighting these blazes takes its toll on the firefighters. In tonight's Inside Story, Teresa Fishnick shows us a side of the job we don't normally get a chance to see. It's 12 noon. Firefighters from southern Arizona get their first chance to rest. For two days, they battled a fire in the hills near Oracle. They worked through the night, and it wasn't until the fire was brought under control late this morning that they were allowed to take a break. All the resources in, this, in the state are stretched to the limits right now. We've got fires everywhere. We've got them on, on in the Catalinas. We've got them in the Rincons. We've got them in the Chiricahuas. We've got this one. There, there's fires all over the state. The state says its firefighting resources are 100% committed at this point. It's using all available crews from 50 rural fire departments, the Department of Corrections, the Department of Transportation, the National Guard, and the State Department of Forestry. It's costly. The tab so far, $1,250,000. Well, you just have to make do with what you've got, um, and, and as soon as you think you've got a fire contained, then, then you release those people and they can go to another fire. May and June are typically bad months for fires, but because it's been so hot and dry, this year has been particularly rough. But firefighters may soon get some help. The fact that this fire was started by a lightning strike is a sign that the monsoon can't be far off. Near Oracle, Teresa Fishnick, Channel 10 News. Firefighters are getting some help from out of state. Eight slurry bombers from California arrive here tomorrow to lend a hand. Well, later tonight uh, on the Channel 10 News at 10, how to stay safe when exercising in the heat. And Dave Muncy shows us how this is all the water it takes for a child to drown. We'll be right back. Tonight, Phoenix firefighters investigate a possible natural gas leak at the Embassy Suites Hotel. That's the hotel near 4th Street and McDowell. That gas leak reportedly in the laundry room of the hotel. We'll let you know more about the story as it develops. And tonight, a woman calls for help as she and her children float out of control down the Verde River northeast of the valley. The woman called 911 from her pickup truck. Police say the woman and her two kids got to safety before rescue crews arrived. Late word tonight of a near drowning in Phoenix, a five-year-old boy at St. Joseph's Hospital under observation after his mother left him sitting on the steps of the pool. She went inside to lay another child down for a nap. It doesn't take a whole swimming pool for a child to drown. Tonight, Dave Muncy shows us how tragically true that is. For years, we've been telling you to watch your children around water. The other day in Chandler, a 14-month-old toddler was left alone in a pool much like this. There was only three inches of water in the pool. That's all we have in it right now. It doesn't take that much. Let me show you something. 
it takes about this much water to drown your child. All your child has to do is swallow that much water and they can choke to death, they can go into a coma, and they can die. This stuff is refreshing, it's fun, it's cooling, it's all the things you want it to be, but it's also a killer. Watch your kids around water. I know you've been uh, talking about this for how many years now? Uh, about 15, 16 years I've uh, been involved in water safety. And we've had up years and we've had down years. It just uh, comes back to haunt us. And you just can't mention it often enough because it seems that some people just never get the message. They still leave the children out there yeah. Yeah. by the pool or in the, the bathtub while they get the phone or do something. Total and constant supervision when you're around water with your kids. And we're talking about toilets, dog dishes, uh, even uh, fish tanks have been deadly here in Arizona. Let's take a look at uh, what happened to us today. We did see, uh, uh, speaking of water, in fact, uh, that's another area that you have to watch those little ones or fountains or anywhere. 108 degrees today. We told you at 6 o'clock, 107, but since then, the temperature went up one degree. It's, it's on the decline now, thank goodness. 89 degrees for the morning, low 106 and 78 normals for this time of year. Record high, 115, record low, 64. 100 right now, a little breeze out of the west at 7, the humidity 18%, the dew point at 50 degrees, a rising barometer, 29.77 inches of mercury. On the rainfall, we're still on the minus side after 2.5 inches on the year. Temperatures around the state today on the hot side once again. Look at that, 124 at Lake Havasu, but that's cool for them this week. 123 Bullhead City, 106 degrees at Kingman, and 103 at Holbrook, 109 in Tucson today. Well, we have a lot of moisture being brought up once again from down south of us, and you can see where it's kind of hanging out right now. This is going to be the story right through the 4th of July holiday. We'll be looking at uh, shower activity, thunderstorm activity through the Central Mountains and along that eastern border down through the southeast as well. Today, some 30-mile, 40-mile-per-hour winds across the north, about a quarter inch of hail and rain, uh, about a half an inch down in Douglas, one and twelve hundredths of an inch in Prescott, and the Chino Valley, about 84 hundredths of an inch of rain. The rest of the country, not too bad. Little Rock getting about three and three quarters of an inch of rain today. So some flash flood watches in that area. Southern Minnesota, portions of northern Wisconsin, and in the Carolinas, some thunderstorm activity. And then once again, just a little bit of activity in the Rockies, moving into the foothills. Look for some activity across areas of the northwest over the next couple of days. Quick look at some temperatures for you. These are the highs on the day. These will be the lows tonight across the state of Arizona. Here's the forecast for you. Partly cloudy, 87 degrees overnight 110 degrees tomorrow partly cloudy again partly cloudy on saturday 110 degrees and as we head into the uh, fourth of july weekend we will once again uh, it's going to be a little humid uh, a little uncomfortable with temperatures coming down however to about 112 degrees and the uv index uh, at nine and that uh, is very high that takes about 13 to 20 minutes to burn fair skin always wear some sort of protection okay thanks dave all right thanks, dave. Well, this intense uh, heat we're experiencing doesn't bother everyone. In fact, some go about their normal exercise routine in it. But is it healthy? Medical editor Clarence Scott tells us about that next. A hormone and its effect on the mind. Tonight, a New York physician says older women taking estrogen can handle intellectual challenges better and think more clearly than those who don't take the hormone. Another study shows estrogen therapy in older women lowers their risk of Alzheimer's disease. Well, needless to say, handling uh, the heat here in our valley is a challenge for anyone. It's especially hard on those who like to exercise outside, but there are ways to do it safely. That's right. Our medical editor, Clarence Scott, joins us now with some tips on how to run in the sun. That's right. Most of us head for the cool indoors when it's this hot outdoors. But if you're one of those brave souls who must exercise in the heat, here are a couple of ways to make sure that you make it through the summer safely. Jogging in June in Phoenix is not for everyone. The intense heat can sneak up on you, and before you know it, you can suffer dehydration, heat exhaustion, or even heat stroke. And don't think it can't happen to you. Even the most experienced uh, athlete can get into trouble exercising at the temperatures that we're having right now. When we're up in above 105, 110 degrees, Walking rather than running on extremely hot days might be a better choice, but without taking the right precautions, you can get into trouble fast. There was one day that, that I didn't feel real good going back home because it, it was really, really hot that day. But yeah, I usually load up on water before I leave and then hit the water when I get home. And it's just common sense to do your exercising during the coolest time of the day. You just have to be wise about the time that you exercise. Obviously, right now, the best time is first thing in the morning at 5.30, 6 o'clock. 
And contrary to popular rumor, don't worry about breathing in hot, dry air. It doesn't hurt your lungs. Instead, focus on liquids. And don't wait until you're thirsty to drink. Many times by then, it's too late, and you may already be dehydrated. And choose water over other beverages. The keys, I think, are prehydration, drinking a fair amount before you go out, taking water and drinking along the way in sips, not big gulps. Uh, the third thing is rehydrate when you come in. Now, the first signs of heat exhaustion are dizziness, headache, nausea, and muscle cramps. And that can happen to any of us this time of the year, even if we're just outside, simply working in the yard. That's right. It can happen very quickly. Yes, it can. Thanks, Clarence. Well, thanks, Clarence. Coming up next in sports, it was lucky number 12 for Martina Navratilova at Wimbledon today. And is Michael Jordan returning to the Chicago Bulls? Todd Whitthorn will explore that question straight ahead in sports. Well, she earned it, but tonight Tanya Harding loses it. The U.S. Figure Skating Association has stripped her of her 1994 national championship and has banned her from the association for life. This is Harding at the national competition. She won after the now famous clubbing put Nancy Kerrigan out of the competition. In its ruling, the U.S. Figure Skating Association said Harding showed a disregard for sportsmanship because she hindered the investigation. It's time for Todd, and how's that? And sports, I like that. and uh, a fun day for Martina. Today. Uh, yeah, absolutely, a very, very fun day. They enjoyed it. As part of the politically correct 90s, Martina Navratilova and Gigi Fernandez were kind and gentle to each other at Wimbledon today. Martina has moved into the finals and will play Conchita Martinez for the title after beating her friend and Aspen neighbor in straight sets. Let's start on the grass with Navratilova. She's in the near court. Martina comes inside. Her return clips the net right there. Fernandez gets it. Watch Martina's casual return. She would win the point, and she won the first set 6-4, to four, and they were having a lot of fun today. Now Martina in the far court. Fernandez miss hits the return. Watch Martina ready for the kill right here. Whoop! But she's going to save her friend. And for that, Gigi Fernandez was very grateful. Let's move on now to match point. Martina serving in the near court. Again, she comes inside. Right here, she's going to leap on the return. Then her forehand return would hit the line. It was in, and she wins. Martina Navratilova moves into the finals after beating Gigi Fernandez today, 6-4 and 7-6. In World Cup news, Argentina's Diego Maradona has been suspended for the rest of the tournament after failing a drug test for banned substances. His absence was felt tonight when Argentina lost to Bulgaria 2 to nothing. Meanwhile, Nigeria is headed to the second round after beating Greece by that same 2 to nothing margin. Let's start in the first half from Foxborough Stadium. Nigeria's George Faniti finds nothing but the back of the net. Nigeria led 1 to nothing. Watch Faniti. He's down on all fours. And then what, what's he doing? George, what? I don't get it. Then there's George Bush. Hey, did you see that, Barb? Kind of looked like Millie. Shouldn't have done it. Second half, Daniel Amokachi shoots and scores. Nigeria would start the celebration at Foxborough Stadium. They're going to the show, the Sweet 16, after beating Greece 2 to nothing. George Faniti. Now that we know that Charles Barkley is coming back, what about Michael Jordan? The rumors have been flying. A story in the Chicago Sun-Times said that Jordan is coming back to basketball for sure, especially since his baseball career is not really panning out. Jordan is hitting just 197 in double-A ball. So, Jerry Krause, what do you say? I think it would be a great idea if the fans of Chicago get used to the idea that Michael Jordan will not be back with this basketball team. I have an itch every now and then to play. Organized basketball, I don't think so. You know, I love to play with you guys in your backyard, but, you know, organized basketball is, uh, you know, I really feel it's time for me to move on. I don't buy it. In Major League Baseball, the Red Sox snapped New York's eight-game winning streak tonight, beating the Yankees 6-5. to five. One thing about being a big league manager, you get really good at spitting. Top of the first at Fenway, no score. Joe Heskis pitch gets past Rich Rowland. Bernie Williams is headed home, but watch the throw to the plate. It hits the umpire, Dan Morrison, in the back. Williams was safe at home. Yankees had a one to nothing lead, but that would not hold up. We move to the bottom of the eighth. Boston trailing five to three. Damon Berryhill drives a shot to deep right center. Williams going back, but he cannot make the grab. Otis Nixon would score from second. Not too far behind was Scott Cooper. The Red Sox snapped their 12-game home losing streak, beating the red-hot Yankees tonight. The final was six. To find. That's okay. sports. Great coverage of soccer. <laughs> George Faniti. <laughs> right. Thanks, Todd. Thank you, Todd. And we have some amazing uh, breaking news tonight. Chicago Airport authorities say they have found part of a knife in an airliner waste tank, and it will be turned over to Los Angeles police to determine if it is the weapon 
used in a Simpsons slang. So we'll hear more about that tomorrow. No Could doubt. be one of the latest twists in a yeah. bizarre case. We'll be right back.